Welcome. Glad to have any uh, first-time uh, visitors with us this morning. We are grateful to have you here at Southside Bible Church. We're currently studying through Romans. If you would turn there to Romans chapter 1. This morning, I'm hoping to finish up Paul's brief introduction of the letter, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking right, but I want to show you a little picture, if you guys could pull it up for me. This is Brendan McMillan at the TG3 conference. Did it pull up? Sure enough. He got a picture there with John MacArthur, and he sent it to me, and he wanted me to know something, that John preached a 50-minute introduction to the sermon. (laughs) And it was so comforting. I have never done that. Okay? So... My introduction will be shorter this morning. I'm calling this series the revival that began in 2020, at least the one that I'm praying for. And I'm so blessed already with God, what God is doing in my own heart already with the gospel that we're looking at in Romans. I could easily preach for another two to four weeks of what we looked at last week in verses two through four with the meditations just that God's been giving me in my heart this week. So I pray that the gospel is... Uh, getting a deeper foothold in every heart here at Southside Bible Church. This morning, I just want to read this section again, Paul's introduction, Romans 1.1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Your fighter verse for this week, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for these words that uh, by your Spirit, through the instrument of Paul, you gave us, and you gave us in a way that they are perfect. They are your words without error. They reveal uh, your heart, your plan, and your truth of this gospel. And so we thank you that we've had the privilege to just kind of look at this in a nutshell as this epistle begins. And I pray that every heart would be barbed by the glories and the beauties of Christ. Lord, I pray that none of us would look with just uh, natural eyes, but that everyone in this room would have spiritual eyes to see the glory and the beauty of this gospel. And so, Father, I pray now as we conclude this section uh, that you would meet us, Lord, that you would be put on display, and that this whole place would be filled with your glory as we finish. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The outline that we've been looking at in Romans 1, 1 through 7, as we said, Paul is giving us five considerations concerning the good news of the gospel. In verse 1, we looked at the preacher of the gospel. He's set apart for God's gospel. God's gospel and all of its its beauty. So don't tamper with it. It has a definite article, the gospel. It is, is God's gospel and we are to know it, love it, believe it, and treasure it. So there's the preacher of the gospel. Secondly, then he unpacks the promise then of this good news that was beforehand through the prophets. So all of the Old Testament has been teaching and showing and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in many shadows and types and various ways. Uh, This is not a new gospel. This is God's gospel that began at the creation of the world, that began in his heart in eternity past. Thirdly, we looked at the person of the good news In verse 3, we saw the humanity of according to the flesh that the Son of God came. He existed for all of eternity and was incarnated into a virgin's womb and was born into this world so that he could identify in our humanity and in his weakness he could be killed on a cross in our place. And then he's buried and then this David did not undergo decay. He was raised from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God in complete victory, the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And so this is the person of the good news. This gospel is about the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And now this morning we'll take up in verse 5 the product of the good news and in verses 6 through 7 the people of the good news and we'll finish up Paul's introduction then, Lord willing. So the product of the good news in verse 5 
through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. <clears throat> Paul will now share with us his ministry and his calling in light of what we've been looking at, God's gospel that took his heart away and made him a bondservant of Christ. This gospel, I've died, I've been crucified, and now I'm, God, I'm Christ. I'm his servant. He's my master. I follow whatever he desires, says, or wants. That's what the gospel did to Paul. And so first, the, the exalted Christ that we studied last week, the one who's enthroned on high, he is the one who's given Paul now a ministry of this gospel, God's gospel. Here you go, Paul, you are to proclaim this. You, you're, you're commissioned and to proclaim the gospel of verses three through four that we looked at, the finished work of redemption by Jesus Christ. So Paul has been given a ministry, a divine gift from God, but it's a gift and a, a calling that requires God's grace to perform it. Okay, Paul, Paul is dependent on the grace of God to do now. Here's your calling, Paul, and I give you the grace to do what I'm calling you to do through whom? Through Jesus. We've received through Jesus grace and apostleship. And it's interesting that Paul's salvation and commission were simultaneous. He saw the risen Christ on the road to Emmaus, and, and, and he gave him his divine commission. And I would just want you to hear it in Acts 26 when Paul shares it. He said, Jesus said, arise and stand on your feet when he saw that glory. For this purpose, I've appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, Paul, to open their eyes so that they might turn from the darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to, the, to God in order that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, Jesus Christ. And Paul says this ministry then, I, I got it from Jesus and I've been giving grace and apostleship then for my calling. Ephesians 3.8, to me the very least of all the saints, Paul says, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Romans, what we're going to study and look at. I've been given grace to preach the unfathomable riches of Jesus Christ in this gospel. And so this grace to, to preach, Paul says, it didn't prove in vain. I labored more than any of them, all the apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. This, this grace has caused me to go over 1,500 miles being tortured and beaten and just keep preaching this Christ no matter what comes at me. Paul was graced by God and gifted and empowered for his calling, which is true of every one of us who are believers in this room. It is so sweet. You might not be called to be an apostle, which none of you are, but you've been called as children of God to be witnesses and testimonies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've been graced and you have a calling. Some of you have a calling to raise a family in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you have been called to go to Tijuana and love orphans and advance the kingdom. Some have been graced to run a business or outreach to your neighborhood or to serve the poor or to endure and deep health afflictions and many different things. You have been called and you have been graced to do what God has called you to do, to put his glory on display. And so it's beautiful that Paul was graced and given grace to proclaim the excellencies of him who's called us out of darkness unto his marvelous light, the great gospel of God and the privilege to declare it. Uh, we have received grace. And uh, I, want it, I want more. I, I want us to live into this grace and learn how to, how to proclaim and put this Christ on display. And so my question, Paul, then, is what is your aim of this gospel ministry that God has given and graced to you? What's your aim? What, what do you want to accomplish, Paul? And in verse 5, he lets us into his heart. He says that to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, the gospel's now going to the world, and I want to bring about the obedience of faith among all the nations, Wait, Paul, do you, it isn't just to bring salvation from wrath. It's, it's not just going to save us from hell and to cleanse our soul and to change our theology and give us a place to serve. 
All of those are a part of it. But he's saying it's unto the obedience of faith. That's my mission. That's my commission, what God has given me. I already told you he, he ends the epistle the same way in Romans 16, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, which is God's gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, <coughs> leading to the obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. What a perfect bookend. The gospel is designed to bring about the obedience of the faith. Very similar to what Jesus said in the Great Commission, go and make disciples is the main command with three participles modifying it. Go make disciples, followers of Jesus, the obedience of the faith. So what does that mean? If, if all of that, Paul, is what you're shooting at and moving toward, what does that mean? And there are many suggestions on what that means. But just in studying, I, I find that there was two main ones that most of the commentators were coming up with. And I, I want you to see that the way the Greek is designed here, it could be either one. So context is going to open it and help us understand it. But just know out of the gate, uh, just from the grammar, it could be either one of these. So first, it would be the obedience, which is faith. It is God's gospel. He's already told us. And he's commanding all of mankind, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 3.23, this is the commandment. Here's the command. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. And so Paul is preaching this gospel to bring about the faith in the gospel apart from works. And so it's, it's, it's uh, the obedience, which is faith. Believe this gospel. Enter into it. Live by faith in the realities and truth of what's revealed in it. The other interpretation would be the obedience that comes out of faith. The obedience that, that, that generates itself from faith. And this was the cry of the Reformation. We're saved by faith alone, <coughs> but not by faith that is alone. It's going to produce works was the whole cry of Luther. As a man thinks, so he is. What we believe is what we will desire, and what we desire is what we will choose. What we love is what we will desire, and faith will come and change everything. Regeneration, that now what you desire is to be a doulos of Jesus Christ. And so Romans 6 has much to say about this obedience from the heart that has sprung from the gospel. And so the question then is, how do we conclude what is the obedience of faith? And I see in chapters 1 through 5, it is a call to believe this gospel. We're going to labor in it again and again. And I want you to obey God and believe in His Son, whom He sent to be a Savior of the world. I, I, I've said this again. It's a shame that i got to call the church back to believe that. I pray that you would believe this gospel. Not 20%, not 70%. What I'm praying and shooting for is that you will obey God and believe this gospel 100%. That it's all finished in Jesus Christ and one stitch of your works will ruin the whole garment of Christ's righteousness. I, I want to fight and labor in that gospel and, and I want you to have obedience of faith. I want you to believe it. But then we'll come to Romans 6, 7, and 8 and 12 through 16, that, that whole thing comes out of the therefore. The therefore is the, the obedience that springs up from faith. So without a therefore, there, there is no obedience. So it's, it's understanding this gospel in light of the mercies of God, therefore offer up your bodies a living sacrifice, and then he will unfold what this obedience looks like. But it, it all springs from faith. It springs from someone who's embraced this gospel and surrendered themselves to it. And so my answer, you probably already know it. What God has joined together, let no man put us under. That's talking about divorce, but I'm talking about the gospel is a call to obey. 
It's a call to believe what God himself has said and done in the resurrection of his son. Believe, and you'll be justified before God. You'll be declared not guilty, and you'll be accepted and loved by God. Without that, every imperative, the commands of God, will only sink and destroy you. As a shepherd, I've seen this for 20-some years in my own heart and in many in this room, is you don't have a therefore and you're trying to live the Christian life by pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, more discipline, fighting harder, and you're just like a gerbil on a wheel, and you're getting nowhere. And so I, I want you to come and learn that without a therefore, without believing the gospel and living into that, you're, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. There's, all of gospel obedience flows out of what's called indicatives. They're statements of what God has done in Christ and the imperatives then, now I can command you. I can't command a corpse, love. Can't command a corpse, share with each other. Weep with those who weep. That's, that's ridiculous to keep commanding corpses to obey God. And that's every cult. Every cult, go change your living, corpse. Go do this. And Jesus says, believe my gospel and you'll get life. And I will raise you and I will put my law within your heart. Now you can obey what, what the law could not do, the Spirit can do. And Romans 8 will wrestle and we will get uh, through that. And I pray that everyone will get a gospel obedience. So true faith, the just shall live by faith sweetens my heart to Christ and I become a bond slave and I give myself to him and by faith I offer up my body a living sacrifice to God. There's my life. The only response to this gospel is I surrender all. That's the obedience of faith. 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11 are the love and the grace and the peace of God that come by faith. Chapters 12 through 16 are to go show that love <coughs> and that grace and that peace with others. We call it the fruit of faith. So friends, it is faith that follows the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be saved from wrath without it making you pure. You can't be saved from sin and still live in it the exact same way. Romans 6 will wipe that out. Faith. And this finished work of Jesus Christ and the continuing work of Jesus Christ brings about obedience to Christ. I'm writing this letter to bring about the obedience of faith. That's my passion and heart for every soul in this room. Obedience and faith are vitally linked and they cannot be separated. And so what God has joined together, our culture and our church in some places have separated Last week we saw he was raised up as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And all authority in verse 4 is the closest connection to this verse. All authority now is his. He's Lord and you come to this Christ and you become a bond slave because of your faith in this glorious gospel. That is it. And I want to ask you this with judgment day honesty. Have you somewhere along the way divorced the two? Because it's happening all over our land and I don't want it in my heart, and I don't want it in your heart. Have you divorced these two things? You don't have faith if you haven't turned your whole heart and life to God. He doesn't want just pieces. He wants all of your being. He wants slaves. To claim to be a Christian and not have a new heart to Christ and obedience to Him is a false kind of Christianity that the Bible knows nothing of. Here's Paul. My goal in all of my preaching and my ministry is to bring about the obedience of the faith. And that's what we're going to go after. I see two errors in our day and age that I've come across often. The first is that obedience of faith, that, that that's it, is you believe the gospel and your position. And that's all that Paul wanted. He just wanted you to believe that. And, and, and all this desire to consecrate yourself to God, that isn't faith. And so there's just kind of, all I have to do is believe what I am. And then on the other side, as I've already mentioned, is just this obedience that works harder, cleans yourself up, keeps the law, beats your body. You, you've missed the therefore. And so we're, we're coming to try to go through Scripture and, and get God's way of bringing about the obedience of faith, not man's way. Man's way is through the law. And through grace is how God is going to bring about from the heart 
the obedience of the faith. And so may God grant us that in abundance during our study here in Romans. I'm, I'm praying fervently for my own heart and yours. I want the obedience of faith. So that in Romans 1.8, Paul said, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all in Rome because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And when we get this, they're already talking about your faith in Morocco and, and different places already around the world. I, I just want the whole world just being overwhelmed and strengthened and encouraged by your faith. And so the obedience of faith is this gospel will bring it about and it will put God on display everywhere as our goal. And so some of you are not going to like this. It's fun to say amen to the gospel. It's fun to say amen to forgiveness till somebody hurts me. It's fun to say amen to love till somebody stretches it. It's fun to say amen to serving the body while I sit on my hind parts. It's fun to say I'll weep with those who weep till I got to give up a football game. It's fun to talk about submission to the government till I do my taxes. The obedience of faith, let's make this our ultimate end in the gospel. Amen? But our next part is what I want to be is our chief end. So I used a very careful word, the ultimate end is obedience of the faith. But I want you to see that there's a chief end that drove everything that Paul's about, and I pray that it drives everything that you're about this morning. And the ministering of this gospel to ourselves and anyone we come in contact with, if you'll look at verse 5, Paul doesn't stop with the obedience of the faith. I want to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Chief end. The glory of Jesus Christ. That's it. Please hear this. It's just not to get people saved. It's just not that people will have the obedience of faith. But it's as they do that, that Jesus' name would be exalted. So what is the, the source and the reason we're living the way we're living and hoping and rejoicing the way we are? It's because of it's all unto Christ. It's that he would be admired and, and worshipped and gloried in. That he would be loved and served and followed on this earth. I, I love Christ. I, I want his name lifted up. And as we come and believe this gospel and obey this gospel, what will happen is Jesus will look really, really good. Will show how powerful he is and how beautiful and how worthy he is. And so our ultimate end is not whether I feel like it or what will happen. Our relationships will be nicer. My whole goal is my chief end of everything in my life is for the glory of Jesus Christ. The gospel is concerning his son, the seed of David, declared the son of God by resurrection, the obedience of the faith, back to the church to show forth the manifold wisdom of God and his gospel. What happens when people come under the lordship of Christ, when they obey the gospel call and they repent and believe it? When they say, not my will be done, but yours as bond slaves, and they grow in it, they become disciples, and they, they learn how to walk as he walked in the body of Christ, and we'll call that the obedience of faith. And what happens is Christ shines brightly. He is shown for who and what he has done. He has shown that he's exalted and glorified, and he's worshiped, and he's worthy to make much of. That is the burning heart of Paul. Not just the obedience of faith. That's a, that's a goal. But it's always higher. And so many people think the other is the end game. But our chief end is that Christ would be put on display for who he is. There is something bigger than us. This could set you free right now to believe that. There is something bigger than you. There's, so, there's a higher end that we obey Jesus than just that it makes me happy. The gospel of God, and he does all the work, and he gets all the glory. The verses of three through four, born of the seed of David and then raised as the son of God. Faith in all of him and obedience shows his worth to everyone around us. My highest end can't just be my happiness. It's got to be His glory. 
and the two can marry in the gospel. But this would change your life. I've seen it if you will let it in. His glory matters most, not mine. Is there any of this in your heart? The new birth should produce this. A chief end where every thing in your life there, there's 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 ultimate ends and there's there's subordinate ends and all these things you're trying to seek and do and we all have them and we can just stop at, at them and not come to this chief end over everything in your life and that's for the glory of Christ when you get the gospel that we're going to see in Romans and believe it and make your life to obey him because he saved you not to get saved Something happens in this new birth where God opens your eyes to see His glory and He now becomes your passion and your mission in life. Don't stay lower that my passion is just to, to do my job. Everything's got to be bigger and move or it, it all breaks and falls apart. And so everything that you're about and what you're doing in your life, it's got to keep pointing to this chief end. Everything in your life is unto that end. When that happens, you get a revival. Let this have its way in your heart this morning. And I'll ask you, is this your theology, but not your practice? To just look at this gospel again and say, is this my heart and my practice? That every day I get up and rearrange my mind and my heart, my chief end, and everything I say and do today will be for your glory because of this gospel of Jesus Christ. So how do we get that? <laughs> Don't you want that? <laughs> how do you get it in your heart? That's what I want. I want it to go deeper, and I just want that to grow and glow. And the answer is our fifth and last point. The people of the good news in verses 6 through 7. Verse 6, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. <laughs> to all who are beloved of God in Rome and called as saints. So this is amazing. It, this is the opposite of everything you've ever known. The people who get the blessing and riches of this gospel that we're looking at is so, it's just beautiful, isn't it? So who gets it? And, and usually in our world, it's those who merit it. Those who are deserving. Those by what class you're in. By your looks. By your morality, the movers and the shakers, that there's some worth in you is how you get anything. And Paul says, no, no, no. The recipients of this glorious gospel that is God's is not what you have done, but how you've been dealt with by God. In verse 7, he says, to all who are two things that matter, not your wealth, house, physique, beauty, popularity, two things that you're loved by God and you're called as saints. Go put that on a resume and see if you get a job. What's special about you? I'm, I'm called by God and I'm loved by God. Let's take a look at the two of them and we'll close out. The call of God in verse 6. He, uh, he says, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. And in verse 7, you've been called as saints, holy ones, set apart. And, and in Romans, we're going to look uh, thoroughly at the, at the call of God. So this morning, I just want real briefly... There's a general call of God that, that goes out to all of mankind. Repent and believe the gospel, and it, it's external. It, it comes externally, and it comes to people, and that's what we call the general call, but there is this special call that Romans is talking about, and Paul here, and this is the internal call. This is when that gospel goes from external, and it comes into the heart. And this call draws me into faith in Christ and seeing his fullness and his glory and his beauty. And then I get this new heart and obedience to my new love. And so it's his doing. And as you, you look around this room and every soul, he gets all the glory. And we're going to just look at it in chapter eight. You should never get over that God called you. I, I was thinking of it driving in today, remembering back in college, the, the calling and how God did it. And so just be amazed that this gospel is so glorious and you are called internally to it. It's a gift from God so that no man will boast. And then where I just want to park a little more this morning because I'm going to flush out the call later is in verse 7. To all who are beloved of God in Rome called as saints. And I want you to hear this then that, that believers in Christ are loved of God. We are the objects of divine affection. 
Solomon is called at one place Jedediah, which means loved of the Lord. And so this morning, every believer, we're all Jedediahs. <laughs> we're divinely loved by God. At Jesus' baptism, the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And now he says that of every believer in Christ. This is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. We are loved of God. And I'm telling you, this is the best love. It's not because of something in us. All that we get from this gospel, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that comes, it's all on account of the largeness of God's heart toward us. It's not us. It's his heart why he loves us, not my heart and how special it is. The, the grace of his love. And this just sweetens the call of God. This call came to me from the love of God for me in particular as a child of God. The, the creator of the universe, Father, has called me into being and it came out of a heart of love toward me. And so Christian, you need to know yourself in this way, the obedience of faith. You're called of Jesus Christ and you're loved of God. Those are the two realities that God himself has said about you. I believe it. That's the call. Believe what God tells you is true, child of God. I am his and he is mine. Do you know this? Is this the wonder of your life? Because the people who get this, that's all they can talk about. It just owns them. You wake up with this thought. You, you, you walk around, I'm loved by God. I'm loved by God. You, it just, it, Romans 5.5, 5, he says, he's going to shed it abroad in your heart, the love of God in Christ Jesus. And most today don't delight in this truth as they ought. I'll never understand why it sits so lightly on the church of God. And I've wrestled. And if you have some ideas and give them to me this week, I'll preach them next week. But why? And I've written down, one, two, three, seven. Seven. I think we've cheapened the love of God to make him just a big love cloud that if you bump into, he just showers it on you. It's his job. He's just a stay puff marshmallow man and you bump the cloud and you just get showered with his love. That's all it is. I think secondly, we've made him like a boyfriend or girlfriend like some of the music on the radio, they, they said if you took out the name of God and put Susie in there or something, it would work the same way. I think where we're going to go in Romans is we quit preaching the bad news of the gospel first. And verse 18, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. I don't think we understand how bad the condition was that we were in when we were graced by God. And we will look at it. Paul's going to spend three chapters on it and we need to understand that Houdini couldn't have got out of the three bonds that held us of the flesh, the world, and the devil. And that there was no way out. And I want you to see how deep and dark it was so that you might treasure the love of God that set you free from that. I think we've overcorrected. I, you know, some of you probably have no idea, but I, I got in a camp where we overcorrected that and all we preached was God's holiness. And so if, if any of you have sat under that, is it's just constantly as holiness as holiness. Without the gospel, you will die under that and you will not enjoy his love. F uh, five, election. <clears throat> I've had more people tell me he doesn't really want to love me. He's a miser with his love. I'm not one of God's elects, so I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to go live my life any way I want. That is nowhere in the Bible. It's wrong thinking. You don't understand election, and Paul is going to flush that out. But just out of the gate, I want you to know it's, a bad, it's bad thinking. It's not God's thinking. Election, uh, he chose us in love before the foundation of the world. Election preaches his love more than anything. Number six. Not understanding the difference between his sovereign love for his elect and his common mercies upon this world is what we've done is we've just taken his love and, and said it's the same for believers and unbelievers. And what we're going to look at this morning is when you see the way God loves his children, it is different. And I've used this illustration before when my kids were growing up. I love every kid in this church. Come get hugs every Sunday. Pastor Murphy loves you. But when I was growing up, my kids were growing up, there was only five kids that I read to every night and kissed on the head 
and made sure they went potty and put their pull-ups on and all those <laughs> sweet little things. <clears throat> I still call and check on Jordan just to make sure. <clears throat> but there's a peculiar love, and everyone knows it, for your own children. And, and if you take the love of God that he has for his children in covenantal love and say it's the same for everyone, you've butchered it. And I think with not understanding that, you're, you're going to just shrink the love of God. Thinking you're exalting it, what you're doing is destroying it. And I want to show and look at that this morning as well. And then seventhly, is we merit our love in this world. Every love I've ever had, I had to merit it. I had to do something and be something or be likable. And somehow you, you get love and so all of a sudden to have this love that has nothing to do with you is very, very hard for us to just embrace the obedience of faith. God set his love on you because he did. It wasn't because you're such a nice guy or girl. And to finally just get that God puts his love on you just because he's free and he desires to do it should overwhelm you, should bless you. And so I want to just look at all of those this morning because this subject is so dear to my own heart because as a shepherd, I, I come across this more probably than anything. And so my heart is to exalt the love of God that we as believers should delight in it. <clears throat> and I believe that is what Paul is wanting to do here with the Romans. Paul says, I'm writing to all in Rome who are beloved of God. To all the people in Rome, I'm writing the ones who have been called, the ones who are in the bride of Christ, he says. And so this is a special love for God's elect, his children. It's a covenantal love that he enters into, that he makes a vow, I will never, nothing can separate you from this love. I will never divorce you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. It's a covenantal love based on God's oath. And God cannot lie and he will never break this marriage covenant with his children. It's a special love. And so this is a love that procures our salvation. I want you to hear Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with love and kindness, covenantal love. So I, I've loved you for, with an eternal love. And because of it, I've drawn you into my covenantal faithfulness and salvation. Here it is. Uh, John 15.13. Greater love has no one than this then one lay down his life for his friends. Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. How can God love us? How great is this love? I want you to hear his high priestly prayer in John 17, 22. Jesus said, the glory which thou hast given me, Father, I've given to them, those at the table, that they may be one just as we are one in the Trinity. I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity and that the world may know that thou didst send me and didst love them even as thou didst love me. That he loves you to the same degree he loves Christ. Because we're in Christ. Don't let that land lightly. Have the obedience of faith because God said it's too good to believe. But his word this morning is declaring it for the child of God. And as we progress in Romans, I won't go into it, but nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So Christian, you must know this love. You will never have any, any assurance until you understand this. Nothing can separate us from this covenant New covenant filled with God's love in Christ Jesus. I love you and I will bring you to glory will be a theme through this book. And so as we close, I just want to look at a couple aspects of this love. I'll even tell you how many numbers so you don't get nervous. Seven. And we're going to fly through them, I promise. But as we fly through them, please just listen and obey and believe, child of God. The love of God is uninfluenced. What causes us to love someone or something is, is, is we, how do we get someone to love us? And nothing in us calls God's love into exercise, attracts it, or prompts it. 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. 
God does not love us in return for ours. And some of us think if I work up enough love, God will love me. If we are ever to love God, we must realize God's love to us was not moved by anything in us. So nothing in us will remove it. Do you get that? Nothing got it. Nothing's going to get rid of it. It's perfect. Second, the love of God is eternal. When did God's love for us begin? Will God ever quit loving us? God is eternal. God is love. And since he has no beginning, his love had no beginning. Jeremiah 31.3, the Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I loved you with an everlasting love. Israel, you only have I known. Have any of you ever done something and that person quit loving you? Nothing that hurts more. And I just want you to hear, this is, this is a love that, that will not end. It's eternal. It began in eternity past and it will go to eternity future because it's in Christ. And thirdly, this love is sovereign. Does God have to love people? Who receives his love and why? Because God is God, he does as he pleases. And because God is love, he loves whom? He pleases. And in Romans 9, he's going to talk about two twins, Jacob and Esau. Same parents, same birth. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Why love one and not the other? And we will see God is free and he loves whom he loves. And he loves whom he pleases. And it's a sovereign love. And it's just something so amazing. If you have it, God just chose to put it on you. And it's not because you're better than Jimmy Joe down the street. Marvel at it. The love of God is infinite. There's a depth which no one can fathom, a height which no one can scale, and a length to which no one can measure. We, we looked at attributes Robin Conwell taught our, our community group, and when we were done, we were just startled at the infinitude of God and to realize His love is infinite. I, I just can't imagine. It's infinite. I can't get out from it. It's immutable. What do you think is the number one excuse for divorce? I don't love him or her anymore. Will you ever hear that from God, child of God? Does God's love change? Can we do something to make God love us any less? Does God love you the same on your worst day? And the answer is in Christ. God loves you perfectly. Perfectly. It will not change. Our love is fickle. His is unchanging. Drink that up. It cannot change. You can't find that anywhere. It's holy. The love of God is holy. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. This love is holy. And in his love, he will purify us to make us holy. If you're suffering and going through hardship, it doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It means he loves you and he's, he's going to bring out more of Christ and draw out more love and trust and glory and beauty. That's his love. It would be unloving to let his children just go their own way. And so many of us pray for that and want that. This love is so beautiful. It's holy and it's going to make me holy. And then lastly, this love is gracious. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's the most gracious thing that the God of this universe would set his love upon a sinner like me only through Jesus Christ and by him. And so if ever you doubt God's love, go back to Calvary with the cross, blood stains all over it. It wasn't an ordinary cross. There's the love of God. And so a definition that I came across on God's love is this. God's love is an exercise of His goodness toward individual sinners, whereby having identified Himself with their welfare, <laughs> He's given His Son to be their Savior. And now He brings them to know and enjoy Him in a covenant relationship forever. I've always used this illustration and I still like it, so I'm going to do it again. I want you to picture that someone breaks into my house and kills everyone except for me. And since Jordan's here, I'm going to give him the privilege of staying alive. So, so me and Jordan are left. And they catch the guy who did it. And we go into the courtroom. And he comes walking by and he says, I would do it all again. 
I would kill your wife the same way and all your kids. I would do it again. And then the judge comes and he hears the, the whole case and he hits it and he says that the verdict is you're guilty of four counts of murder and you're going to go sit in the electric chair. I said, you know what? I'm going to let Jordan go sit in that electric chair for you. And I'm going to forgive you of everything that you did. And then I'm going to adopt you in my family because I got all this money I want to give to somebody. And you're, you're, you get everything. I'm going to make you a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? I can't get over the love of God. The obedience of faith now is to believe, to believe what God has said in his word about us, to obey that we love because he first loved us. Faith is to believe he loves you, and you have to look at God's gospel, stared in the face concerning his son, and let it flood your heart and never get over it and grow in it and, and give, it, give it away in obedience. And so I pray grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to close with a quote I got from Tim Keller. He said that, kind of in the conclusion of this passage, is you put yourself in God's place. The fall has made us put ourselves in God's place and to act like we're God. And so he came into your place in verse 3. He entered into this world in, the, in, the, in a seed in the flesh, according to the flesh. And now he offers to put you in his place, in this resurrected, victorious place at the right hand of God. He offers to put us in that now by his work, the love of God in Christ Jesus. And when that gets in, you know what happens? All I want to do is put that on display. A Christ who could love me like that, I, I want the whole world to know who, who this Christ is and what he's done. I want to believe it, and I want to live it and show and tell everyone of this amazing love that he would die for me. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I pray for any who have separated faith and obedience. God, I pray that all of us this morning would look afresh at this gospel, that we would marvel at your, your love. God, who, who can fathom such love? There's a height and a depth and a breadth and a length that no man can fathom. God, I pray let every heart by your Spirit believe what you have said is true in your word for your children. Oh God, what a love. Lord, I pray it could set so many free in a million different ways this morning. They're trying to live this life without believing that. And so I pray for the obedience of faith. That in Christ, this is true of every one of us. God, let it be the controlling influence of our hearts so that all that happens now, our chief end, our chief end is that Jesus Christ would be praised, adored, and loved. God, I, I love him, and I just want him marveled at and believed in and called upon and worshiped and loved. God, let that be the, the unifying of all of our hearts this morning is that that is what we join our hearts together and that is our chief end. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ.